Good afternoon, everyone. We have a bit of a tight schedule today, so we're going to start on time and try to keep things moving. I'm Brian Amkraut, the Executive Director of the Alora and Alvin Siegel Lifelong Learning Program here at Case Western Reserve University. It's my pleasure to welcome you to a day at the university, a symposium on the life and legacy of Newton D. Baker. We have a number of community partners in this endeavor, in this endeavor the League of Women Voters of Greater Cleveland, the Cleveland Council on World Affairs, uh, and Teaching Cleveland Digital as well as the City Club of Cleveland. Uh, I want to thank uh, Mike Barron from Teaching Cleveland Digital. This is really uh, his brainchild and uh, John Grabowski uh, putting in an enormous amount of work uh, to convince, uh, hopefully not have to conjole uh, our speakers to join us today because uh, I know they love uh, what they do and sharing uh, their knowledge and, um, uh, and, uh, and taking feedback, having discussions with you will make the day fun. So I'm going to introduce John. Uh, who is going to give a brief uh, introduction uh, to Newton Baker, uh, and, um, and then we're just going to flow right from there. So Dr. John Grabowski uh, received his bachelor's and PhD from Case Western Reserve University. He's an associate professor in applied history uh, and historian and senior vice president for research and publications at the Western Reserve Historical Society. He specializes in immigration and ethnicity, Cleveland history and public history, particularly the fields of archives and museums. And he's really just been a great partner to work with on many endeavors uh, as we bring knowledge to the community. Uh, so John will kick us off for the day. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Brian. Okay, I am here, as, as Brian said, to provide an introduction um, because the following speakers will fill in some details. And my, my point is, is not to get into the minutia of Newton D. Baker, but rather to try to place him into the broader context of the era in which he lived and the major events in which his life, which his life intersected. And it's, uh, I, I won't read the title, you can do that as well as I can. Uh, this picture is actually of Baker as Secretary of War. Uh, but the dates are really quite important when you look at them, 1871 to, to 1937. Essentially, Newton D. Baker is born at the beginning of what is christened as the Gilded Age um, and dies um, just during the New Deal. Uh, and we'll talk about his attitude toward the New Deal. We'll set up some discussion on this as we go through. Uh, Baker was born in West Virginia. Uh, his bio is, is quite, quite interesting as we go through, I'll unravel bits and pieces of his, his biography. Uh, he would then uh, go to uh, college and he went to Johns Hopkins, which is very, very important because Hopkins is the first research university in the United States. So Hopkins intersection at Johns Hopkins, at, at, at Baker's intersection with Johns Hopkins brings him into a new way of university life and exploration of, of knowledge for purpose, um, that purpose being research. It also intersects him with, if I can use that as a verb, with one of the most important figures in his life. Uh, one of his instructors there is a guy who was moonlighting while he's at Princeton. His name is Woodrow Wilson. And Newton D. Baker studies under Woodrow Wilson. Uh, fortunately, and I'll be a little loose and quippy here, that, that Baker chooses the same party as Wilson eventually, which will give him uh, some legs later in life. As I mentioned, he comes in at, at the, at the uh, beginning of the Gilded Age, and I've put up an image here of Mark Twain's uh, novel, which is the, the term for that period, which is a term in which I would argue that the United States is, is moving into an era of unbridled industrial capitalism. And, and the major issues that are being sorting, sorted out are a nation that is growing well beyond the, the size that anyone imagined, not just geographic, but also population-wise. And as diversity, which is my field, is expanding enormously. And the battles between capital and labor become some of the strongest that you will ever see in the United States. So this, this is the era in which Baker is growing up as a young man. And by the time he is at Hopkins and then goes on to Washington and Lee for his law degree, uh, he, he is straight in the middle of a nation that is trying to sort itself out, uh, trying to feel, feel its way through new relationships between capital and labor, diversity, and a growing urbanity. Uh, for a guy from uh, West Virginia, he ends up in a, a really urban place called Cleveland. I, I love the picture here, which is the, the manum uh, being given by the workers and others to the, uh, the plutocrats, uh, the term that which was used at that point. 
the issues of the Gilded Age would require another lecture. Let me focus on, on those which I think uh, relate particularly to a city like Cleveland. And fortunately, I was able to rip off a cover from Collier's Magazine in 1899 to bring this together to you. Um, 1899 is just about when Baker will come to Cleveland. Baker comes to Cleveland to clerk for a lawyer named Martin Ferran who is Irish. He had met Martin Ferran while taking a trip to Europe. He met him on the ship. Ferran mentioned him and another colleague of Baker, uh, Mr. Howe, Frederick Howe, knew Martin Ferran and indicated that Baker might be a good lawyer. So Baker comes into Cleveland uh, just at the turn of the 20th century. Uh, the city has just suffered one of its many strikes, uh, the great streetcar strike. And if you look carefully at the image to your left, uh, uh, there were deaths in that strike. There were bombs thrown. The, the local National Guard, known as Troop A, was brought out to combat strikers. And if you look carefully, you see two policemen supposedly shooting into the crowd randomly. On the other side, this is the hopeful part of, of Cleveland at that point. Uh, it's the story of Tom L. Johnson, again, another lecture. Uh, Tom L. Johnson is the shadow, I would argue, in which Baker's life is lived out. And uh, that is not deservedly so. Uh, Johnson has made his money in streetcar franchises, exactly the same thing that, that would create the chaos here in Cleveland, not that he was a part of it. Uh, like Saul on the road to Damascus, he falls off his mule and he becomes a single tax or a reformer. And to make a long story short, spends the rest of his life, his health and his well-being in trying to reform society, to modernize government. And he brings in a group of people so to, to help him. If you're wondering why Tom Johnson died, if you'll excuse me for a second, he is supervising some uh, road construction while mayor of Cleveland. And, and you will note that he is not svelte. Um, uh, John, Johnson basically, as one person said, ate himself to death, but he also stressed himself to death. Uh, but that's the trivial part of this. We need to get Baker into town. Historians have this, and I look at my colleague, Ken Ledford, we have this, we, we block out things into periods, and, and our students always think that I, on day 20, period A ended and period B started. Uh, the Gilded Age morphs slowly into the progressive period, and the progressive era really is something that begins in the late 1890s, and historians are still arguing as to when it ends. And what was progressivism? Uh, it is a mixture of a number of things. Uh, is it enlightened self-interest? Is it altruism? Is, is it simply a means of co-opting the opposition that is forming in the United States? Here are two progressives that you, you know but whose names are not there. Uh, one is Jane Addams. Middle-class woman, well-born, uh, fairly well-born, well-educated, and goes on to found uh, Hull House Social Settlement. The whole social settlement movement, the organization of charity and philanthropy are part of uh, the progressive uh, life. Those aspects of altruism that we want to see in, in progressivism in the United States. Uh, the man with the beard who would be right in style among my students today uh, is Washington Gladden, uh, a minister. Uh, from Columbus, Ohio, and Gladden is one of the many clerics who look at religion at that time and basically say the true way to follow religion if you're Christian is to live your life as Christ would have done. It's the social gospel and to use religion to give back to the community. So all these things are palpable there in the air when Newton D. Baker comes to Cleveland, a part of his choice, but also in the air where, oops, not to him yet, is really the politics of progressivism. <clears throat> And, and I, I bring you two politicals here um, who would actually share a, a ballot. Uh, at, at the national level, and this gets into a story we'll get, I'll get to in a second, is Theodore Roosevelt. How many of you watched the, uh, the Ken Burns series on the Roosevelts? Uh, probably one of the better recent Burns series that has come out. And, and the other man is the man from California. This is Hiram Johnson, the governor of California. And so if you're looking at noted progressives in the United States at the turn of the 20th century at the national level, uh, there is Teddy Roosevelt, who was not supposed to be president, but thanks to a misguided young man from Cleveland who assassinated William McKinley, he became president. Uh, he had been parked in the vice presidency by Boss Platt of New York and other people in the Republican Party who said he's not conservative enough, he's trouble, get rid of him. And uh, essentially, as Mark Hanna would say when McKinley died, now that damned cowboy is president. So he has come in many ways, rightfully and wrongly, to epitomize progressivism at the national level. Hiram Johnson in California. 
and Johnson advocated for measures such as the referendum and recall, changing government, making it more democratic. If you follow the progressive period all the way through, you end up with the direct election of senators. Uh, you end up eventually, later on, at the end of the progressive era, maybe not with voting rights for women, but more about that later. This is the world of this young man who comes into Cleveland. And uh, there's another aspect of progressivism which I do want to touch upon. And, uh, and that is that I concur with the historians who argue that many progressives were in a search for order. Uh, this was a vastly expanded United States. Things needed to be standardized. The word science was into everything, scientific management. Uh, organizations were established to really make professions more reliable. Now, historians became organized in 1884. You could do the whole thing. So there's a search for order. And this man is Frederick W. Taylor, and he's the father of scientific management. So when you look at a lot of progressive change in the United States, or let's say here in Cleveland, uh, housing codes, for instance, the construction of bathhouses, the, the labeling of streets not by names but by numbers that were sequentially, they're all part of, of this search for order. And, and this intermingles itself with how do you build a better life? Well, you use science to rationalize things. You hire managers for government rather than political hacks. This all comes together. So it's altruism, it's politics. It maybe is co-option. It is a search for order. This is the world that Baker is in. If my father were alive, he'd like to tell you what the time study man meant in the factory in which he worked. If you wanted to look at it boldly in Cleveland, if you want to split this, there, there are two faces here. Uh, one is Mark Hanna, and the other is Tom L. Johnson. And I mentioned a bit about Johnson. Hanna's an intriguing figure, again. Uh, Hanna really is, comes from New Lisbon, Ohio. His family is Quaker in background. Um, he comes to Cleveland, the family runs a grocery store. Uh, he prospers, goes to Central High School. He marries the daughter of an iron ore and coal broker, inherits the business, eventually gives up his day job in Hanna Company, if you will, to manage politics full time. Um, he is essentially, my, my word here, he's the Karl Rove of the late 19th century. He's the man who invents the modern political campaign in 1896. Uh, next to him is the convert, uh, Tom L. Johnson, is a much younger man. And, and they are both, uh, they, they both do combat as politicians and they combat as, uh, as street, streetcar franchise owners once in the past. But the interesting thing here is neither of these men is against finding a solution for the problems that affect the United States. Hannah is desperately trying, trying to find some way to bring capital and labor into some sort of synchronous orbit where they can deal with one another. Um, he's hearing other people, somebody you'll meet later, Eugene V. Debs, and socialists and anarchists who are in the United States advocating for other solutions. Johnson is also looking for a solution to what ails the United States. The man who's lost in this, well, before I get there, uh, he doesn't have a statue yet. That is Newton D. Baker. Um, and so if you want to look around Cleveland, who is remembered, who is forgotten, uh, Marcus is just around the corner from us, uh, sculpted by Auguste saint Gaudin. And uh, Tom Johnson is now in storage on Public Square. He's moving around. Uh, but he has an alter ego, a different statue behind the Western Reserve Historical Society. So this is my takeoff point for, for Newton D. Baker. Who was he? What did he do? Uh, Baker was part of the political triumvirate uh, with Tom L. Johnson. Uh, Baker started as associate law director. He then became city solicitor. Uh, when Johnson lost the mayorality in 1909, Baker moved into heading the Democratic Party in Cleveland. He would hold that position into the 1920s. He was chair of the party until 1936. Uh, and he's posed here with Peter Witt on the left. And, uh, and you, you get a sense of the stature of Newton D. Baker. He's five foot six inches tall. Uh, and, and if you want to compare him with Johnson, Johnson is a man of the streets. He's an inventor. He's an entrepreneur, to use that term, which is plastered over every wall I see nowadays. Uh, and, and Johnson works his way up, and, and he is a convert. He reads uh, Henry George's single tax theory and goes on from that. Baker is totally different. Baker is a college-educated young man. 
uh, much younger, I think by nearly 20 years than, than Johnson. Uh, so he's coming into this changing city where I would argue that Johnson is working with passion. Baker also has passion, but his passion is channeled by his education and his broader viewpoint. The man on the side is the labor leader, the gadfly, Peter Witt, who minced no words in dealing with the establishment of Cleveland. Uh, his, uh, his terminology for that club down on Euclid Avenue, the Union Club, his term was the Onion Club, and uh, took it from there. So when, when Tom Johnson needed somebody to really goad the masses at his tent meetings, it was Peter Witt. But behind all of this is the city solicitor, the lawyer, the trained young man who is moving on, and Johnson will sadly suffer defeat, and in 1912, Baker will come there. He builds on Johnson's legacy, you can read that as quickly as I can. <coughs> and I'm going to deal with two years here. Um, there, there are two things, there are three things that happened in 1912 that are really quite intri intriguing. In 1912, Newton D. Baker is inaugurated in January as mayor of Cleveland. In 1912, one of the most important and I think exciting presidential elections in the history of the United States takes place. We'll talk about that. And Baker will play a major part in that. And in 1912, the state of Ohio finally gets its act together and decides to reform its 1851 constitution. Now, I know Tom will talk a bit about this, or somebody will mention this, that, that you know, this Constitution was built for a rural society. And, and to reform the Constitution, there were over 40 different amendments that were proposed for the Constitution, including things like referendum recall and home rule. We were just talking about fracking and home rule at the table, but that's another discussion um, in Ohio. And, and the other issue that I see in this, because I'm an urbanist, is, is the vision of what Ohio is over the years. The Great Seal is water and corn and grain, and the reality in the picture of 1913 rolling mills in Cleveland is industrial Cleveland. And so every time that industrial cities would say, we need a different way to govern ourselves other than that dictated by the state house, they would be shut down. So it's through the Constitutional Convention that home rule is passed, it is made available, and in 1914, Baker, as mayor, gets home rule passed in Cleveland. Cleveland is allowed to govern itself in a way that it feels fit to govern itself. Now, there are different edges to this, but again, this is an introduction and, and not a deep discussion. Uh, the other things basically are, you know, recall, uh, referendum come, come out of this constitutional convention. And so there are some changes, uh, and we'll get to one that didn't happen in a few minutes. Of the 40-plus amendments, I think all but four passed. I'm doing this without notes, so you don't have to quote me. But it is a sea change in government in the United States. Newton D. Baker is it in, in Columbus pushing for change. Hiram Johnson has traveled from California pushing for change. This Ohio is a nationally significant state. We say that often, sometimes it's cliched, but at this point it is central. And in 1914, the election is supposed to be between perhaps these two people. Uh, it's baseball season, maybe the Indians need a pitcher. Uh, but William Howard Taft, who was Teddy Roosevelt's selected successor in 1908, is running for president against the former professor, head of Princeton, Woodrow Wilson. Uh, Woodrow Wilson was a good, fairly good baseball player as well, but that's another story. And, and within this, uh, as you may know the story, at this point, <clears throat> Roosevelt and Taft have fallen apart as friends. Roosevelt is extremely unhappy with Taft. Gifford Pinchaw has been, been let go. Taft is too conservative. So Roosevelt contends at the Republican convention. Uh, but thanks to a Cleveland Republican boss, Maurice Maschke, the, the Ohio delegation is loaded with pro-Taft people. Roosevelt does not get the Republican nomination. He bolts and forms a third party, the Progressive Party. It is the last third party to have any modicum of success in the United States. Uh, Wilson will win, Roosevelt will come second, Taft will come third, and Eugene Victor Debs, the socialist candidate, will pull 6% of the vote and come fourth. Uh, I love this picture of Teddy Roosevelt. So what happens to uh, the rest of the uh, political progressive action? A little nod here, one of the, uh, the issues on the ballot in 1912 was suffrage for the women of Ohio. It doesn't win. 
And I know Marion Morton will be talking about that. Also floating around the edge of the progressive agenda are African Americans. And the picture on the other side are Russell and Rowena Jellis, the founders of, uh, of uh, Karamu House, founded in 1915. So progressivism has its limitations. Uh, May 1915, the sinking of the Lusitania, Europe is at war. The other aspect that, that is within the worldview of, of Newton D. Baker is the rise of the United States as a world power. The uh, Spanish-American War in 1898 and then the, the challenge of the First World War. Uh, Baker has uh, left the mayorality after two terms and has founded a law firm that still exists today, Baker Hostetler. His intention is to make some money so he can finally support his family and to do what he does best, law, and his former professor invites him to become Secretary of War. And he'd been uh, he offered a couple of positions in the cabinet before that did not uh, take them. So he takes the job in... Uh, 1916, and, and the war follows in April 1917. He's the Secretary of War quickly. He's a young man, five feet six. The troops call him Nudie Cootie. Uh, he's not very prepossessing in his trench coat there. But what he does is he takes that perfect, perfect progressive ability to organize, and he creates an army where there was no army. He helps organize war industries where there was no organization of war industries. And he does all of this fairly even-handed. And although there, there are canards tossed at him for giving deals to this manufacturer or that, he comes out fairly squeaky clean. He does an incredible job between 1916 and 1921 organizing the United States for war. Uh, but there are issues in that war that challenge the progressive identity. Issues of civil liberty. <clears throat> Uh, that is Secretary Baker drawing the first number in the draft. If you remember Vietnam, you remember the draft. Uh, the draft had been imposed on both sides during the Civil War. It went away, and the question was, should we have another draft? There was pushback on that. Propaganda was organized through the Four Minute Men. This, this was a time where the federal government really took over the running of information in the United States. Uh, Painting the enemy, uh, even before Mr. Zimmerman, in, in, these, issue, uh, in these images. Uh, advocating in some ways that one should watch one's neighbor for their loyalty. So all of this is, is beginning to, to come through. And uh, the, at that fourth presidential candidate, Eugene V. Debs, gives a speech in Canton, Ohio during the war. He says something that is construed as being seditious. He's brought to the Northern District Court of Ohio, tried, I believe, for sedition, if the charge is correct, and he is put into federal jail. So we're dealing with limits on free speech. So I'm saying all of this because when the war is over, the question is, were the progressives really good or were they bad? Uh, is this a spot, a spot on their legacy? And some historians argue that the experience, the death in the war, the overregulation of the war, the misleading information about the war in many instances is negative for progressives. Uh, <coughs> but our friend Baker continues to fight the good fight. And the one thing that, that literally kills Woodrow Wilson is arguing for United States entry in the League of Nations. And uh, it's a great cartoon here. And, and Baker takes it upon himself after Wilson's death to argue for Wilson's legacy. And there's one aspect of Baker's life that really is outstanding at the 1924 Democratic Convention, which Cox and Roosevelt would be nominated as the ticket. He gives a speech in favor of the League of Nations. And, and he gets, I think, almost a 20-minute ovation. The plank is still voted down in the platform. But he gives one of the greatest speeches many people have written ever delivered at, at a national convention. So he still is fighting the good fight. But he comes back to Cleveland. He's in and out of politics. He's, he's uh, nominated to a number of boards. And in 1932, according to some pundits, he's waiting in the wings at the Democratic convention just in case Franklin D. Roosevelt is not nominated as the candidate. Uh, so there, there is speculation that this man from Cleveland could have been the candidate in 1932. But Roosevelt is nominated. I love the picture, but you notice, you notice this, the progressive comes up again. So the question that bounces up is, were the New Dealers 
the grandchildren of the children of the progressives? Is this, is this the ultimate denouement of the progressive movement? That's still open for debate. Uh, Baker, as I said, Roosevelt is nominated. Baker is not selected. So to bring this to a close, where are the monuments for Newton D. Baker? Uh, he dies in 1937. Uh, he has a national and international reputation. He was an international figure. Uh, one of his quotes that I dearly love is when he was nominated for Secretary of War, some people said, you can't have Baker there. It's not that he's too short. He's a pacifist. And, and he, was on, he once said, I'm, I'm, I'm a pacifist to the point where I will fight for it. Okay, um, and, and so he, he dies, and he dies, when he dies, he's at odds with the New Deal. He's at odds with the New Deal because he thinks federal authority has been extended too far. He's at odds with the New Deal in, in part uh, because he feels there's a lot of corruption going on in the way things are handed out. Uh, but one of the things that, that is not remembered except really on this campus is the fact that he is one of the people who advocated for adult education in an accessible, affordable way and at hours at which people who were working jobs could be educated. That was part of what he saw at World War I. He saw the soldiers. He felt they needed to have educational chances when they came back. And that led to the founding of Cleveland College, which I'll leave my colleague uh, Richard Bazin to talk to. And this building uh, used to be on Public Square where Key Tower is now. Uh, was named the Newton D. Baker Building. And this was the Newton D. Baker Building, which stood on this campus until 2004. It has now been replaced by the binary walkway. Uh, but this was the Cleveland College of Case Western Reserve University. So there's a lot to this man that we don't know. It's a complex story, but it's a story that intersects with one of the most important areas of American history. And I will be political. It's some of the things that were going on then, we are now dealing with now. Thank you. Now. <clears throat>